There's one place in my Han where no one likes to go. A long time ago, this building was an original Elder Beerman's. Uh, the entire giant half of this strip mall was just the Elder Beerman's. And we have strange things underground that I've mentioned a little bit about in the past. One of the cool things that we have is uh, the original Elder Beerman escalator. In fact, we have the entirety of it still in our haunt. We can't use it for guests because of the uh, you know fire code won't allow it, which is understandable, and it's just too expensive for us to you know renovate and fix. But that's not the bad spot. The bad spot is this one little secret closet that's hidden in the freak show. Inside that closet is a stairwell that leads to a just a wall. The stairs go all the way up and then just deads in dead ends to a wall. Another quick explanation about this is when they renovated it from the Elder Beermans into the strip mall that, you know, they closed off a lot of sections so they can separate things to rent out spaces better and such. And that, that's that's reasonable excuse. It was also the, the origination point of a pretty major fire that happened when it was Elder Beerman. Uh, not a lot of people died, but enough, enough. Fast forward to years, after, decades after that, when it was a bingo hall. Uh, there was a fire in the kitchen at the bingo hall, and it spread. And again, only a few people died, but it, it was enough. There's a lot of strange things that roam these halls. There's actual spirits. There's things that uh, none of us can properly identify. But the thing on the closet in the freak show is perhaps the most terrifying at all of all. Now, this creature, um, I can tell you that I'm not even sure what it is. And that, that's pretty pretty rare. I've talked to people with more knowledge than I have, than I have, much more knowledge than I have, and they don't know what it is. But the most frightening thing of all is that it does not understand what it is, or no. Imagine a being that can wield a, a fairly insane amount of power that, that's basically a child. It's not good, it's not bad, but it throws tantrums. It wants what it wants, and it doesn't know how to get it except to, to take it. This has been a cursed position in, in our haunt. The first two years, we could not keep a carnival barker for the freak show. And back then, it wasn't even a freak show yet. It was just the opening to the carnival. The initial rumor was that our first barker, who only lasted for three weeks during that, that first season, attacked a loved one to the point where he put them in the hospital and then committed suicide. And the week leading up to this, he just kept saying that something back there was talking to him, something back there was talking to him. This was constant all the time at the haunt. He was afraid to go back to his spot and would not go back there if he was the only one at period because it wouldn't stop talking. Of course, back then, you know, I was just an actor then. I wasn't in management or anything, so that wasn't my area. And when the hunt was open, I didn't really have any time to go back there. And when we were there cleaning and building, the little I got to help out with that year, we were always busy. So there wasn't many opportunities that, you know, for a while at first. Um, one second. Sorry, a little parched today. <clears throat> it's the Beetlejuice voice got me. So, you know, that went on for, you know, like I said, the first three weeks or so, and then that, that tragic event happened, and then we restaffed it. Um, we restaffed it with another person right there on the stage. They lasted one weekend and um, had a complete nervous breakdown. And they, uh, from my understanding, never haunted anywhere after that. Uh, I talk to them very rarely, occasionally. They're definitely not the same person they were before working with us. It was someone I had known prior to this. And all they ever told me was, you know, it wouldn't stop talking. It wouldn't stop talking. I couldn't stop thinking was the last thing they started saying. And then, okay, uh, we kind of didn't put anyone back in that spot. We had the original bearded lady, Keisha. Uh, she was still in that area, but just not by that door. And she said it freaked her out back there, but nothing happened. Didn't think anything of it. Year two comes along. Um, again, we tried a couple different people in this spot. And again, I, I still wasn't even quite management that year in year two. I was just helping out more and still nothing, you know, we, we could not keep anybody there. So, um, that year I was Beetlejuice in the queue line, but I would sub as Beetlejuice as the Barker, which later turned into the very beginning of JB Rotten and the end of year two. And it wasn't until I was back there that anyone would stay. And for the first five or six nights I was back there towards the end of that season, I experienced, you know, I knew something was there because you could just feel it. Like you, you just, everybody, even if you weren't sensitive, just feel that whatever this was, I'd go in the closet. I'd look, I'd sit there like kind of in the dark by myself for a little bit to see if anything would approach nothing. But then any night I wasn't there, whoever was on the stage would complain about it and complain about it. And then we did, um, 
it's a version of hide and seek we do. It's called haunt and seek. I talked about it a little bit before. It's with the mirror man story and some things like that. Um, Matt was uh, our very own Matt here at the network was uh, was playing that night and he hid back over there near that door, this secret door. And he said that um, he got this really strong vibe and something was telling him to just stay quiet and not move and not even breathe because they were trying. It was trying to explain to him that someone was going to catch him. And so he literally but then when he stopped moving and stopped breathing, he couldn't start moving and start breathing again. And he said that the weirdest thing about it was it was his own inner voice. Like, you know how, like, you hear yourself talking your inner voice you, so you know it's yourself, like, thinking things? It feels like that, and you hear your inner voice, but it's not your thoughts. So you get this vibe that it's just not you that's talking to yourself. And that's the only way it could communicate with him. So I was like, okay, that's, that's interesting. I kept a little bit more of an eye on it. Uh, year three, when I officially started the Freak Show, uh, about two weeks before we opened, I went in the closet. I was in the building. I uh, made sure all the lights were out, and I just sat there in the complete darkness uh, for half an hour. And I just kept talking, like, hey, I'm, I know you're here. I just want to touch base, see if there's anything I can do, kind of a situation, trying to come into this, you know, being helpful, hoping that it was some kind of problem that could be solved or, you know, someone that maybe that needed to move on or just anything that I could do. And I start hearing my own voice in my head, you know, just talking, but it's, it's weird. If you've ever uh, <clears throat> seen the stupid my movie that I made or the, the sounds of crimson books, it, it was like that kind of voice, like an amalgam of like all these voices, but in this case, it was like they were all, instead of working together and talking like a Legion-like thing, is like all the voices were trying to say the same thing or similar, but they were all fighting at the same time to be heard. So it was very like off-putting inside your head. It's very discordant. And, and it, it freaked me out. Like literally, it made my skin crawl. And I went to get up and I went to open the door when it happened because it freaked me out so bad. And whatever it is just slammed it. And like you could feel this pressure on the door. You couldn't even turn the handle all of a sudden. And the handle's like, it barely functions. I could have ripped it right off the door, to be honest with you. Like, it, it really didn't do a lot. So it should have opened easily. And, but you can just feel the weight just shifting against this door. But you're not seeing anything because it's, it's complete darkness. But you can kind of feel it. And it doesn't feel like a person or anything. It just felt like a, a – I can't explain it. it just, just a force was there. Like, your hands will go through it, but you can feel pressure. And it had to have been a lot of pressure for me to feel it because I have pretty extensive nerve damage. So pressure – is one of the things I still can kind of feel on my skin, but it still takes a lot of it to feel it. And then I felt like I couldn't breathe all of a sudden, but it, it just kept talking to my head about how, you know, it needed something and I had it. And that's the best it could kind of explain to me. And then, you know, I kind of let it feel me out a little bit more. I stayed just stayed quiet. I didn't even try the door for like probably another 10 minutes. And on the inside, like I'm dying inside. Like, oh my God, like, is this, is this how I die? Is this like the moment, like me, you know, constantly having to poke the paranormal. And even though I'm trying to be helpful, I've gotten into some bad situations and I'm thinking, is this, is this the last situation I'm, I'm ever in? Because like I said, there was no one in the building. The building was locked. It was just me in here. And I'm in a closet complete on the other side of the goddamn entrance, any of the entrances to the hot. So no one was going to, you know, even if they did get there, no one would get to me in time. And cell phones don't work back there because it's just a dead zone. So there was no communication. And then the pressure just goes away, okay? And it just kept talking. And I realized I could open it. I tried it. I went to open it. But it wasn't barring. It was still talking, but it wasn't barring me from leaving anymore. And, you know, we, we talked for a little bit. And the basic gist of what it could understand, at least at that point, and the beginning of year three was it takes things from people that it doesn't have to better itself, sort of. That that's that's the sort of setup. It might have been a spirit of someone once, but it had become anything that ever died on or near the property, uh, anything that it could just latch onto a customer, a person, or it, it had been there since before Elder Beerman was even there. Apparently, it was just it had been there on the land, and it sort of felt like everything I built up around it. And because the way that the things were made back then, it was actually trapped in this space. It cannot leave this space, even if it wanted to, and it wants to. It just cannot physically leave the space and it, it tries to attract things that it doesn't have people to have conversations because it's lonely but it's terrified it's new it doesn't know it doesn't understand what the world is it doesn't understand the difference between even people and animals it, it doesn't register that there's a difference so i got to know it 
I started kind of leaving like little offerings, you know, just little polite things, comments. The beginning of every night, I'd disappear in the closet for five or ten minutes and just talk a minute and then leave. I mean, it started feeling comfortable talking to me when I was just back there on the stage, like through the wall. It would tell you know, in in my head. And then more and more people it started talking to. But the more we talked to it, the less dangerous it became, which was good at first. It it was good until you realize that you're seeing all these customers pile back here, and that to it is more energy, aka food. And the more holdups we get out there, because you're going through that our big elevator experience, which is a timed thing. So sometimes you'll have like a couple of groups miss the elevator and kind of spill out into the freak show, or they'll run around the hallway too quick because they're scared. And you look up and there's three groups coming into your curtain at once. You're like, oh, I've got to entertain all of them and separate them out into groups and push them through again. So it would get really chaotic. And in those chaotic nights, you couldn't keep track of what it was doing. You you just couldn't. There was no way to like. Usually if there was one group, you can kind of look at people and you'll know because you'll see somebody kind of like looking around. They won't say anything, but you can tell when it's affecting someone. But on those nights, it would feed more because we couldn't pay enough attention. And it's this foreboding feeling like most of the people that work at the haunt don't even know it's there. I have never been told, but they'll mention to me like, hey, I don't know how you handle it back there. You know, when you're in the freak show because of, you know. The vibe you get back there, I'm terrified to walk back there. All the actors I've got in there now are fine. Things are they're kind of better now in some ways, but I'll get to that. So it was just this constant point of I felt like I couldn't talk to anybody about it because I was worried that if I talked to someone about it, that would violate any agreement that we made because it didn't really want to be known that it was there. And if you know anything about making any kind of agreements with anything in this world, paranormal, normal, Woods based or not, you you're kind kind of bound to keep your agreement because bad things tend to happen when you don't keep your agreements. So kept it quiet. And then more people started discovering it by the end of year three. And then the build season for this year got pretty insane. It was, did not like that things were being built around that it couldn't see. Because in its eyes, we were just almost at adding to its personal little dungeon. Like we were just changing the layouts, we were doing all this stuff, we were painting, we were building. And it started getting really restless. And we had some very angry people during build season at a couple different times in the building. And that riled it up to the point where it was trying to physically force its way out through the, through the closet opening. And it was way too big for that. And it actually cracked the inside of a solid steel um, frame of the door. And you can see the crack. It's all the way up at the very top. And it's from the inside out. And We've looked and looked, and even our tech guy was like, there is no way that could happen unless something giant was trying to force its way you know, out of that. that. That just doesn't, it's a certain type of stress crack, I guess, in the steel that he was explaining. I'm not a steel guy, so I can't really speak to a lot of that. And then it just got quiet for about a week. There was nothing. There was no vibe. So we were, at that point in time, terrified that it had actually gotten out. When we came in that day, so like every day of that week, I, I showed up a lot more than usual that week. And we would just check different areas, feel the vibes, like try to figure out where this thing went. Turned out that it had gone nowhere. When it couldn't get out, it decided that it needed to devise a new plan. And this is where things got extra dangerous this year, this whole new plan it decided to make. It figured out how to extend part of itself out the door. Like out the door to kind of like almost like a lantern fish to kind of like lure you in, but like mentally, I guess. So people started trying to get into the door. Like this is before customers. This is still like workers and stuff. And more and more people would just suddenly just naturally like from all over the building start gravitating. Like they'd walk in the door and you'd see them set something down and they just walk back to the free show. One day I went back there and there was eight actors who aren't even in or near the free show. They were just gathered there in like this weird half circle staring at this hidden door. And it's hidden behind this, like, ticket booth thing that we kind of had built when we had it moved over there before we opened this year. So, like, you you know that there, we all know the door is there, but you just can't see it to the public because we don't use it. And they're just there. And I walk up. And as soon as I walk up, um, the door opens. The ticket booth thing we have in front of it is made of, like, PVC, like, really light PVC piping and some, like, um, it looks like canvas pretty much from, like, a painting. They just stretch canvas over like a little wooden frame to kind of frame the thing in. So it weighs, I can move it with one hand and I can't hardly lift anything. But the door opened. No one was in it. And the whole booth slides to the side 
and just open. And we have lights on in the freak show. None of the light from the freak show is spilling into this room, which has never happened before. Usually you could at least see kind of lights of the freak show in the room, so you could see like the floor in the immediate area. Nothing. It was just a wall of solid darkness right where the door frame was, like right there in your face. And you could put your hand in there, kind of wiggle it around a little bit, like try and see stuff. You could not see your hand. You could stand at the opening. Your hand could be right here, and if it was slightly in, it just looked like your hand was missing. So before I could even like fully react, all eight of them just start piling, piling in the closet. I mean, that's what we call it as the closet. It's because the steps lead to nowhere. They start piling in it, and they start one by one walking up the stairs. And I'm screaming like, guys, get the fuck out. What are you doing right now? What is happening? And this this point, I'm now feeling no vibe from the closet. I'm hearing nothing. Which means logically, the only thing I can come up with is that it had blocked me somehow. Somehow it had masked its energy, but was immediately affecting all of them. And none of them were responding to me. All eight of them, one by one, finally in this fucking pit of darkness, basically. Nothing. There was not even any sounds coming out of the room. It was like once they crossed in, also I couldn't even hear their footsteps, just nothing. And I realized at that point in time, the only way that that's going <laughs> to. If it can turn out well, I've got to go in this room. So the door starts, it's starting to close. When I make up my mind, it's starting to close behind them. And there's no hinge on this fucking door. It just opens or it's closed and it's really fucking heavy. But it stayed open by itself that whole time. So I'm like, fuck, what am I going to do? All right, I got to go in. Uh, You know, I'm a manager. I. I'm responsible for these people. I don't know what to do, but I just kind of like snuck right in and the door just slammed behind me. I checked it. It was not going to open. It was not going to open anytime soon. So the, the pressure was back on the door, but like way more, way stronger than it was before. And I look over and now I can, I, I can almost make things out in the darkness. Like now that I'm in the room and I can see their shapes, they're already on the first uh, landing for the steps. Cause there's like, there's three or four, there's four landings that you go up on these stairs that kind of go around like in a box manner, like most old school stairwells before it hits the, the, the dead end wall. There's no rails. So if you fall on this thing, it's all solid concrete. You're going to die. So they make it to the second landing and I'm following them up, still hollering, still screaming. No one's paying attention. No one can hear anything. And then I hear it. And my, again, my own inner thought in my head, and it's, you weren't supposed to be here. And my immediate mental response was, I'm definitely supposed to be here. You're not supposed to be doing what you're doing. And then silence. Everybody stops moving, like just dead, like frozen, like in step even, like walking up stairs. And then it's back to utter darkness again. And I, now I feel isolated. Now I don't even feel like I'm in the same room anymore. I know I have to be, obviously. I didn't get transported somewhere magically. But it's like now there's pressure on all four sides of me, like squeezing me in, where I can't even move now. I'm just standing there in this room. And then I hear, again, my inner voice. And it says, if you stay here, I'll let them go. I'm like, okay, we'll let them go. That was I, no, no thought about that. No thought whatsoever. And one by one, I can hear footsteps again. And I hear people filing out. I hear the door open and the door slam shut again, probably about, I don't know, 30, 45 seconds after that. But with all this pressure around me, it's like this new level of darkness. So I couldn't even see that when the door opened. I, I'm seeing nothing. So I'm pretty sure they're out. I mean, I, I'm assuming this thing kept its word. Usually you, they're bound to, but you know, you never know. And it invites me to sit. And by inviting me, I mean the pressure around me starts shifting me until I'm at the stairs. And then the pressure starts coming from above me. So I have no choice but literally to sit on the staircase. And the pressure just stays there. I'm in silence for forever. It could have been 30 seconds. It could have been a half an hour. I I don't know. It it was timeless. The the feeling was timeless. You You were there, but you weren't there. And there was, like, the whole world had just fallen away. It speaks again. And it informs me that I've made my decision, that I've stayed so they can can go. And it needs me to help it escape. And if I can figure out how to help it escape, 
it'll eventually let me go once there's proof of its escape. I ask it, what, what's your plan when you leave? And it says, we've always been here. You know, we don't know. And some voices were we, some were I, some were they. Like, they were all saying the same thing again. And it's just radiating in different parts of my head. And it's it's confusing. And they're confused. And I'm confused. And then it was just pure terror. It, it, it was pure terror for me. I pissed myself. No lie. No joke. Like, I legitimately pissed myself. And I'm feeling it running down my leg. Hot. I, I can't feel the temperature, but I can feel kind of like, you know, I don't, can't see it either. And uh, I'm not going to let this thing out. It knows at this point now that I'm not going to find a way to let it out. I'm going to sacrifice myself. That's what you do. You don't let terrible, big, terrifying things that are capable of things that even you don't understand just out. You can't do that. And I didn't respond. Again, it could have been 30 seconds. It could have been another 30 minutes. It could have been, it could have been days with the way it felt. It wasn't. It didn't turn out to be days that when I by the time I got out, but it just it felt like another little eternity. And I just sat there, and finally I said, "I just said no." That was it. Just no. And then again, nothing. Thirty seconds, thirty minutes, thirty days, thirty years. It was just this oppressive silence. Like it wasn't even silence. It was so quiet that I don't even think there was a word for it. Like, I should have been able to hear my fucking hair grow with how quiet it was, but it was just, just nothing. Again, no light, no, nothing. I'm just enveloped in this intense pressure, but now a smaller box because I'm sitting on the stairs. And then I feel the upper pressure just disappear, so I stand up on the stairs. It's shifting me again, but it's shifting me up the stairs. So I make it to the third landing. Let's move a little faster. I make it to the fourth landing where the wall is. And I get right up to the wall, and the pressure just sandwiches me in. Like, I'm, like, now, like, flat with my hands like this, like, flat against this wall. Like, it's it's pushing me in. I'm, I'm, I'm a heavy set guy, so, you know, it's got a lot of gut to kind of push in there against the wall. And then it got to the point where it just enveloped closer and closer, and my face was just... I couldn't turn it sideways in time, so my face is just up against the wall now, and now I can't. It's getting harder to breathe. I got a little bit of air, but it's it's getting harder to breathe. The pressure in my chest is now building, like almost as if the wall, it's just shoving me so hard into this wall. And I thought it was going to black out at that point. Like, I mean, I guess it wouldn't have made much of a difference anyway because I already couldn't see anything or feel anything or hear anything or smell anything. But I thought I was just going to lose. Like this, again, the whole this is this is it. This is your final stupid moment. You you made it out last time when you thought it was done, but this time there's literally there's nothing. And again, thirty seconds, thirty years, thirty minutes, whatever it was, passed again. And the pressure was gone. The pressure just all disappeared. I started to walk down the stairs. I made it to the third. And it was like there's this wall of force that I couldn't move down any farther past down from the third landing and it started to talk to me again in my own inner voice it needed an arrangement the problem was not even so much as getting out of the building because the more i thought about it and the more it considered my no and its ability to understand what my what i was thinking because it was already in my head i realized that it it probably couldn't even exist on its own outside this building because what food source would it have it wouldn't know how to approach people. It wouldn't know how to get what it needed. But we were already giving it what it needed because it had people nonstop. And it could feed enough for, in the span of one night, it could feed enough to sustain itself for six months or just energy. And it realized that it needed to stay there, to feed, to grow, and to what it called complete itself, which is why I was still hunting for qualities of certain people, for parts of people I'm mostly metaphysically from my understanding i hope i hope there was many you know decades it was there before me and it's an area that people disappear in sometimes but no more than any other town so you don't really think about that kind of thing and i mean i did i did at that point but not before then and probably not much since after and it and it said in order to let you out i need a guarantee 
again, I'm paraphrasing here because it's hard to remember exactly, even though when it's in your own inner voice, it's so shocking that like you get the feeling of it and you get the gist of it, but that's kind of really about it. And in order for me to leave that day and I won an amendment that that minute also wouldn't affect anyone that worked there, especially anyone that worked near the door, because if I was going to walk out of this and I was going to give something up, I needed it to give some source of something. up. So I felt this pain just right, right up here in my chest. It wasn't pressure anymore. It was like, it was, it felt like something was getting ripped, not off of me, but from inside me. That was how severe the pain was. And I fell to my knees on that third landing as this whatever it was just felt like it was being ripped at. And then the agreement was made. And I didn't understand exactly how the whole process worked. You know, I, I thought what I wanted from it, which is, again, you know, not just me being able to leave, but me being able to keep people there safe. And my understanding at this point still of the agreement is that it needs to eat. It needs more energy. It needs more whatever it is that I can't quite grasp or what was torn from me from other people. And so now the only option I have is to make sure as many people as possible get in the door and get right out of the pre-show that things pile up so we don't notice it feeding. Because if we notice it, I think it's going to be harder to let it feed. But if we don't let it feed, I'm worried about what will happen if I don't get back whatever it took from me. But at the end of this year, if it has, it says it'll give it back. The agreement was made. I don't know. But I think even more than that, I worry about what happens if we do close this year? What happens if it no longer has a source of anything? Will it find a way out before it's completed? And if it does, will it not make it like it thinks? Or will it find that one person that lets it in? That one first person that lets it in so thoroughly that it becomes and it spreads whatever this is to not, not other haunts, not even just other businesses, but to anywhere else, to everywhere. And if it does that, how far can it go? Can it multiply? If it's out of a space, what, what can it do? And not knowing what it can do and not knowing the answers to that question, that's really why I need to keep this place open, more so than anything else, to keep whatever that is in inside. So that that's my current care with my own personal boogeyman at a haunt. And I guess if you really think about it, he's also my personal monster in the closet these days. So I guess Mr. Jones isn't alone anymore.